Like all nations, Kenya has been founded on the efforts of many people, institutions, professions, corporations and organizations. One of the organizations upon which the nation has been built is the Kenya Red Cross Society, which has provided unstinting humanitarian services to hundreds of thousands of Kenyans since before independence 50 years ago. Today, there is hardly a major catastrophe, a road accident, a fire, a flood, a famine that ravages the lives of hundreds of thousands of Kenyans that does not draw a quick response from the Kenya Red Cross Society. Its ambulances are seen ferrying casualties to hospitals. Its staff help and console victims of natural disasters and human violence. The society is by far the most important philanthropic organization in the country. It is also one of the most self-reliant. Until recently, most of the society's funding had come from overseas donors. Since the country's independence, the society had made several attempts at establishing income-generating activities. This was largely in the form of small-scale businesses operated by the branches to fund their activities. But these could not sustain Red Cross operations in Kenya. Then, in 2007, the Kenya Red Cross Society established the Red Court Hotel in Nairobi. The success of the 60-room facility began to sustain some of the society's philanthropic operations. The Red Court Hotel would be followed in 2009 by two five-star hotels in Nairobi and Eldoret. The BOMA group of hotels is now in operation and is run as a separate venture under a company limited by guarantee. In addition to the hotels, the Kenya Red Cross Society established an ambulance company in 2009 that seeks to provide critical health care in emergencies to paid-up members. With a business model of subscription, the ambulances also respond to emergency situations involving non-subscribers under the Red Cross banner of alleviating human suffering. The ambulance company is currently the largest private ambulance fleet in the country, based in all the major towns throughout Kenya. Partly because of its income-generating activities, the Kenya Red Cross Society has of late been able to convert its financial portfolio from a debt of about 500,000 US dollars or more than 42 million Kenya shillings in 2001 to a surplus of 50 million US dollars or 425 million Kenya shillings four years later. These efforts at sustaining financial self-sustainability by the Kenya Red Cross Society received praise from President Mwai Kibaki when he officially opened the Boma Hotel in Nairobi on 9th January 2013. As your patron, I heartily commend you for this great initiative. I would like to once again congratulate the Kenya Red Cross Society for investing in our tourism sector through the establishment of the Bomas Hotel. I wish you great success in this venture. With these few remarks, it is now my pleasure to declare the Boma Hotel officially open and to congratulate all these ladies and gentlemen who have been involved in this work. We made a conscious decision and said we have to create a company which will run these uh, enterprises that we are, we are creating here. So we have a board of directors here who are running and managing the business enterprises for ourselves. The business enterprise that we have here, I think, when it is fully operational, Boma in Nairobi, Boma in Eldoret, and Boma in Nyeri, when they are fully operational, would be able to employ at least about 600 Kenyans. That is not a small number of people. If you are focused well enough, knowing what you want to do, definitely 
you would be able to carry out both the humanitarian activities that are there and the enterprise. The Red Cross story has its beginning back in 1859, when a young Swiss businessman, Jean-Henri Dunant, appalled by the condition of the wounded soldiers in the battlefield of Solferino, Italy, during the Franco-Austrian War, arranged relief services for the soldiers with the help of the local community. He later wrote a book, Memory of Solferino, suggesting that a neutral organization be established to aid wounded soldiers in times of war. Just a year after the release of Dunant's book, an international conference in Geneva adopted his suggestion and came up with what came to be known as the Red Cross Movement. The name and the emblem of the movement are derived from the reversal of the Swiss national flag to honour the country in which the Red Cross was founded. Today, there are 188 National Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in the world, all serving to prevent and alleviate human suffering. In Kenya, the work of the Red Cross during the 1914 to 1918 First World War was conducted as part of the British Red Cross, because Kenya was then a British colony and had not set up a Red Cross society of its own. Red Cross volunteers worked from Kenyan bases in support of British soldiers who were then fighting German troops in neighboring Tanganyika. Red Cross operations would end with the war, but in 1927, Mrs. Ailsa Turner, then president of the East Africa Women's League, proposed that a branch of the British Red Cross Society be formed in Kenya under the auspices of the Women's League. Her suggestion was accepted, and under her chairmanship, the League took over the management of all Red Cross activities in Kenya. After the war, the British Red Cross would also work in close collaboration with the St. John's Ambulance Organization through the operation of a national ambulance service. Its fleet started off as black and later very dark blue vehicles bearing a small white circle with a red cross emblem on the side. These vehicles operated alongside those operated by clinics, hospitals, voluntary organizations and the police. In 1933, a red cross room was opened in the Memorial Hall on Delamere Avenue in Nairobi, where lectures, demonstrations and courses were held. As a result, a number of trained Red Cross workers were ready for service when the Second World War broke out in 1938. In East Africa, the war was confined to the Horn of Africa, in present-day Somalia and Ethiopia, where British and Allied troops fought Italian forces of the fascist Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, who had taken some of the area. Throughout the war, the Red Cross in Kenya supported the British and Allied war functions through the provision of hospital supplies and comforts, as well as the rehabilitation of wounded soldiers. It was during the war that in 1940, an independent branch of the British Red Cross was established in Kenya, marking the establishment of a clear distinction between the Women's League and the Red Cross. In 1940, however, the Red Cross would be amalgamated with St. John Ambulance. The Kenyan branch of the society worked mostly under the control of the colonial office, directly through the colonial governor, Sir Philip Mitchell. Because of the segregationist policies of the colonial government at the time, membership to the Red Cross was also discriminatory. Indeed, for one to be qualified for membership, one had to be British-born. That's how the society's early divisions were to be found, mainly in the so-called White Highlands, in places such as Thika, Nanyuki, Kisumu, Nakuru, Londiani, Gilgil, Eldoret, Nairobi and Mombasa. After the Second World War, the Red Cross would adopt a clear policy targeting the alleviation of human suffering in general as the core mandate of the society. 
activities identified to be part of that mandate included home visiting, medical services and the establishment of homes for the blind and mentally disabled. This change in policy resulted in a reduction in the number of staff working for the Red Cross. Immediately following the new policy, key projects were developed. The Red Cross introduced the first air ambulance scheme in the country. Intended to benefit the settler community which was dispersed over different parts of the country, the air ambulance service was run by the Red Cross in collaboration with private airplane charter companies. The project was funded by the government in cases where government employees were airlifted. Non-government employees catered for their own costs through Red Cross subsidies. This was the same time as Africans started being represented in the country's Legislative Council, or LegCo. The first African LegCo member, Eliud Mathu, was nominated in 1944. It was also the time that saw the first Africans accepted as members of the Red Cross in Kenya, even though they received a distinct badge to show racial difference. But 1952 was also the year that the British colonial government declared a state of emergency in Kenya in response to the Mau Mau rebellion. Among those the British government jailed and later detained on charges of supporting the Mau Mau was the leader of the proscribed Kenya African Union, Jomo Kenyatta. Thousands of Mau Mau fighters were killed by British forces, whilst hundreds of thousands of Mau Mau suspects ended up in detention camps, where they would languish and some die during the five years of British military efforts to contain the rebellion. Hundreds of thousands of other people in central Kenya would be resettled into so-called protected villages, leading to a serious humanitarian crisis that required the attention of the Red Cross. The Red Cross did respond to the crisis caused by the state of emergency, but its response was not completely impartial. The colonial government directed that the society's assistance go only to government functions and government supporters or sympathizers. Nevertheless, the Red Cross managed to set up an emergency fund to deal with Kikuyu refugees whose lives were endangered in the reserves. It set up its base of operations in detention camps all over the country. In the most affected regions of the country, the society provided humanitarian assistance to Africans who were victims of the Mau Mau. A case in point was the appeal fund that the Red Cross set up to help the victims of the Lari massacre in 1953. Red Cross efforts to work outside government demarcated areas were often met with resistance from the government and the white settler communities. Notwithstanding such reactions, the Red Cross continued to pursue an impartial and non-discriminatory policy in the fast-changing political situation in the country. It was indeed in 1954 that the Kenya branch opened up positions for Africans within its leadership. The first African to join the Red Cross Appeals Committee, which was responsible for raising funds for the society, was Mesha Kandisi. The British government did not succeed in ending the Mau Mau rebellion until 1957. By that time, Britain had given in to a number of African political demands. The first elected Africans joined the LegCo in 1957 to represent African interests. They were Tom Mboya of Nairobi, Oginga Odinga of Nyanza Central, Daniel Arab Moy of Rift Valley Province, Masinde Muliro of Nyanza North, Lawrence Oguda of Nyanza South, Bernard Mate of Central Province, James Muimi of Eastern Province, and Ronald Ngala of Coast Province. 1957 was also the year the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, obtained permission from the colonial government for the first time to visit Mau Mau detainees and prisoners in Kenya. The report the ICRC made after visiting detention camps and prisons where more than 35,000 Mau Mau suspects were being held became the subject of debate in the British Parliament in London concerning the terrible treatment of Mau Mau detainees. 
it would be one of the factors that influenced the British government's decision later to start releasing the detainees and prisoners. Kenyatta and other freedom fighters who had been detained following their conviction for support of the Mau Mau movement were released in 1961. They promptly resumed their political campaign for the country's independence from British colonial rule. Independence would come on December 12, 1963, with Kenyatta as the new nation's first Prime Minister. For the Red Cross, the country's independence also meant independence from direct control by the British Red Cross Society. A new organization was established, with the first African Secretary General, Mrs. Rachel Mzera, who in 1956 had been one of the first African so-called junior members to join the Red Cross in Kenya. The president of the new Red Cross organization was Charles Rubia, who had been appointed the first African mayor of Nairobi the year before. On independence, I was still a member of the Red Cross. Yes. I was the mayor of Nairobi as well. The first thing that uh, we had to do, everybody in Kenya had to do, is to convert one's political and social lifestyle into independent Kenya. And uh, those of us who are involved in the Red Cross work had to start thinking we couldn't be an uh, independent Kenya country yes. with a British Red Cross. As you may know, the, one of the pillars of Red Cross movement is that it has got to be national. Yes. Eh? Yes. And you can only have one Red Cross in any country. So, we couldn't have British Red Cross branch here. <laughs> so we had to convert ourselves into Kenyan Red Cross Society. The national stature of the Kenya Red Cross would later be formalized when in 1964, the Minister for Health and Housing, Joseph Otiende, introduced the Kenya Red Cross Society Bill in Parliament. The bill sought to accord the organization privilege in supporting government emergency operations of a humanitarian nature. A key concern among most of the parliamentarians was whether the society would serve independently and in all parts of the country, not as had been the case when it was under the control of the colonial government. A specific call was made to the Red Cross not to run their activities in large cities only, but to spread them throughout the country. Concern was also raised about how fast the society could be Africanized, with Africans taking all positions of leadership in the society. Some MPs expressed fear that the Red Cross might benefit only a small clique of powerful people close to the president. Despite these concerns, the Kenya Red Cross Society Bill was passed into law by Parliament, and on December 21, 1965, President Kenyatta assented to it, making Kenya Red Cross an independent auxiliary of the government, now able to further the humanitarian mission of the Red Cross movement in Kenya. The following year, on September 14th, Kenya acceded to the Geneva Conventions, binding the country to international humanitarian laws. Two months later, on November 3, 1966, the Kenya Red Cross Society gained full recognition as an independent national society and was officially so recognized by the ICRC. And in September the following year, the Society was admitted as the 107th member into the League of the Red Cross, now called the International Federation of the Red Cross. In 1964, when it became independent, I was appointed as a Secretary General for Kenya Red Cross Society, okay. and uh, I worked there for seven years. It was difficult those days, by the way, mm -hmm. difficult, because the, the organization was not really known by our Kenyan people. people. It was a, a voluntary organization, and to get people to volunteer their services and their money 
it was very, very difficult indeed. Okay. However, we managed, and during those days, I mean, we had a lot of uh, European volunteers, some Asian volunteers, and a few Africans. And I, I don't really uh, blame them at all, because you see, volunteering your, your time, your money. They didn't have that kind of cash, they didn't have the money, and the time was uh, specifically for, you know, their work. So, but we did manage. These achievements should have suggested great progress on the part of the Kenya Red Cross Society. But the first five years were difficult times for the society. Political independence resulted in many whites, including members of the Red Cross, leaving the country. With their departure, the society had by 1965 accumulated a deficit in the annual budget, leading to a reduced scale of activities. Things would get even worse when the government later cancelled its direct funding for some of the society's operations. In 1968, the society's president, Rubia, sent out an appeal for more Africans to join the society so as to fill the gap that the departing Europeans were leaving behind. Among prominent Kenyans who became members of the society was the future Nobel Peace Laureate, Professor Wangari Mavai, who ended up as a director of the society. Several years later, Robert Oko, Minister for State for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, would join the society as a life member. Others included Mrs. Margaret Kenyatta. But there were other problems besides the departing whites that accounted for the decline of the Kenya Red Cross Society. One was financial mismanagement that would persist for years and eventually force the society into bankruptcy by the late 1990s when it was unable to pay for goods and services. Clearly something needed to be done to arrest the deteriorating situation. In 1973, the society moved from its headquarters located near Parliament Building to the city's South Sea area, following the completion of the society's disaster store there. The new site became the society's first income-generating activity through rental of its space to tenants. That was also the year that the titles of the leaders of the Red Cross, like those of all other organizations in the country, changed from president and vice president to governor and deputy governor. This followed a decree by President Kenyatta that the titles president and vice president be reserved only for the country's head of state and his deputy. It was after 1984, during the governorship of J.M. Kasyoka, a member of the City Council of Nairobi, that this first income-generating activity took place. There would be other attempts to stabilize the operations, culminating in the adoption of the 1999-2004 to 2004 strategic plan, one of whose major elements was a pilot project on decentralization of the Kenya Red Cross Society. The overall goal of the plan was to strengthen the positioning of the National Society through the efficient and effective implementation of relevant programs that benefit the most vulnerable, and which contribute to the development of communities. The main programs of the plan were disaster preparedness and response, HIV AIDS, community-based health care, promotion of humanitarian values, and capacity building. But nothing much came out of the plan. The Kenya Red Cross Society was simply incapable of implementing it. By 2001, the society had accumulated debts to partners and clients to the tune of 20.5 million Kenya shillings. Donors decided to freeze funding. The society's staff became demoralized as its reputation became questionable. The society definitely needed major changes if it was to survive. In 2001, the International Federation of the Red Cross in Geneva sent its Deputy Secretary General, Abbas Goulet, to try and rescue the situation. Goulet took over in 2002 as Secretary General, even as Paul Birech took over as Governor the same year. 
As part of the sweeping changes, the society's board of directors and executive committee were also overhauled. Immediately after independence, uh, of course, you had nationalists who believed in the organization, its ideals, its principles, its values, people who are committed to do good for, 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 for mankind and for the community. But as uh, time went and as leadership evolved and changed, like in many things of the second, second generation leaders in many African countries, both politics and even in humanitarian organizations, there were people who were more self-centered and more self-seeking than remaining true to the principles and the values of organizations like even the Red Cross. So unfortunately, there was a, a long period of close to 20 years of mismanagement of the organization from the late 80s up to the end of the 90s and early 2000s. So Kenya Red Cross was not exception. Unfortunately, it was totally mismanaged by its own board, by its own management. That aid was coming in, but the resources were being misappropriated and misused for individuals and personal gains, as opposed to for the community and for uh, developing the institution itself. Uh, so the society had run into financial problems. It had a financial deficit of uh, half a million uh, US dollars at the time, about 23 million Kenya shillings. In the year 2001, January, when I joined the society uh, in the second spell as, uh, as a secretary general. So, 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 so really it was um, the lowest ebb the society had gone to, uh, where the society was assets and properties were being attached by auctioneers and people and institutions and companies that uh, had not been paid for services and goods for many years. Under Gulet's and Berech's leadership, the Kenya Red Cross would recover its position as the leading national humanitarian organization, recognized across the world as one of the best performing national Red Cross societies and an example of what local relief groups can achieve. Within nine months, Goulet had fixed the management and financial problems of the society and finalized a five-year HIV-AIDS strategic plan. I was HIV. I was Tangu siku hiyo baka saa hii wamenifanyia vitu vizuri sana nimejua baka nimeendelea hata watoto nimewapata wakiwa negative By the time he had returned to Geneva in 2003 Goulet had revived donor confidence programs were being well funded professional staff were in place and the Kenya Red Cross had a 15 million Kenya shilling surplus in the kitty Despite being the first African to rise to the position of Deputy Secretary General of the IFRC, Goulet resigned his position and returned to Kenya in 2004, where he was promptly elected Treasurer of the Kenya Red Cross Society, serving on the board. In the same year, Goulet was appointed Secretary General of the Society. Abbas has been uh, one of the most uh, active members when he was what we used to call Junior Red Cross. Yes. Then when we went to Geneva, I think that was the turning point. And he has been very successful. And uh, I remember that time when he was seconded for two years yes. Yeah, yes. to overcome that problem exactly. of 21 million deficit where we were being auctioned. Yeah. And for him, within two years, to develop the, the headquarters and, uh, and still he is on the move. He is thinking of so many things and uh, I pray that uh, God give him more strength so that he can uh, do much more. Under Gullet, the society developed and adopted a new strategic plan for the years 2006 to 2010, one of whose key objectives was completing the decentralization which the earlier plan had envisioned but never quite achieved. The new emphasis was on decentralizing administrative structures to the grassroots level through the establishment of eight regional offices that managed the society's 64 branches. 
regionalization enhanced branch access to disaster response materials and related logistics, which resulted in timely response to emergencies. The recruitment of highly competent technical staff at the regional level succeeded in enhancing quality in programming, leading to an increase in the number of funded projects as well as increased partnerships at local level. Each region had a regional manager, a regional health officer, a regional disaster officer, a regional finance officer and a regional logistician. In the beginning we were very small and if a disaster would occur, we would just concentrate on that disaster. Okay. Yeah? But now, it is a long-term solution. We are not thinking of only that disaster. We are thinking how we can rectify the situation, how we can do it in a better way, how it should not occur again. Yeah? Okay. If a famine occurs or if a drought occurs, we are thinking now how to make boreholes how to make ir irrigation possible. So it is a change now. Okay. We, were, we started in a very humble way, but now whenever a disaster occurs, we are the first ones to reach and the last ones to go. And uh, we have got 70,000 volunteers, but we still need more. You know, we are blessed with uh, so many natural resources in Kenya. We just have to exploit them. The implementation of the new strategic plan would lead to major improvements in the operations and reputation of the Kenya Red Cross Society. Its growing stature, especially among African Red Cross societies, accounted for the choice of Nairobi as the venue for the meeting of the Supreme Body of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, the International Red Cross General Assembly, and Council of Delegates in 2009. It was the first time the Federation had held any of its biannual meetings on the African continent. In these meetings, the Federation determines the general policy of the organization, elects the President, appoints the Secretary General, and takes decisions on the admission and suspension of national societies, among other important matters. It was during the Nairobi meeting that Paul Birech, governor of the Kenya Red Cross Society, was elected the Federation's Vice President for Africa, a position that only underscored Kenya's preeminence in Africa's Red Cross movement. The Kenya Red Cross Society was part of the group of African National Red Cross Societies that in 2004 established the new Partnership for Africa Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, NEPARC, with its headquarters in Nairobi and Gullet as one of its founders and first Secretary General. The partnership was set up in response to weaknesses identified in the Red Cross movement all over Africa, including the lack of an African vision of humanitarian relief, an inability to attract and retain top-quality professional staff, the inability to develop medium- and long-term strategies, a lack of South-to-South -South cooperation, and the incapacity to mobilize in-country and regional resources. Even as the administrative structure of the Kenya Red Cross Society evolved into its present strength, the Society pursued its central mission of preventing and alleviating human suffering in the country, brought about by both man-made and natural disasters. These have included floods, drought, mudslides, disease outbreaks, fires, accidents and human conflict. An aspect of post-independence development in Kenya, as is the case in many developing countries, has been the migration of people from rural to urban areas. This migration has been accompanied by the mushrooming of slums in large towns that have resulted in increased vulnerability for slum residents. The most prominent risk has been that of the slum fires, to which the Red Cross has responded on numerous occasions. But slum fires were not the only tragedies that Kenya Red Cross Society had to deal with. On the morning of August 7, 1998, Al-Qaeda terrorists drove an explosive-laden truck into a commercial building on Haile Selassie Avenue, Nairobi. 
Their initial target had been the American embassy, but it was heavily guarded. So the terrorists opted to bomb the adjacent cooperative bank building, bringing it crumbling down on people and shattering glass and debris that killed and maimed hundreds of people. What followed were days and nights of scouring through the rubble in a desperate race against time to find survivors. The Kenya Red Cross responded immediately with medical and ambulance services, its volunteers being the most visible at the scene of the bomb blast. The society organized and appealed for blood donations. It set up tracing points where lost people could be reported to and a tent for psychosocial support for any persons, victims and social workers alike to ease traumatic stress. The society also assisted in food and water provision for aid workers. After the emergency response, the society started a post-bomb rehabilitation program to support surviving victims of the disaster for a period of one year and put them back on their feet so they could lead normal lives again, free from the trauma they had suffered. The bomb blast was one of the major tragedies that the society had to deal with so far, but it would not be the last. Fourteen years later, on September 21, 2013, the Red Cross would be called upon again to help victims of another major terrorist attack that took place at the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi, this time by Al-Qaeda associates, Somali-based Al-Shabaab. It took the Kenya police and Kenya Defence Forces more than four days to clear the mall of the terrorists at the end of which more than 70 people had lost their lives and more than 175 had been injured. Al-Shabaab claimed their attack was in revenge against Kenya sending troops to help African forces fighting Al-Shabaab in Somalia. As in the case of the American embassy bombing, the Red Cross was at the forefront of the rescue operations. It carried the injured to nearby hospitals, and it organized a very successful blood donation appeal, as well as helping to raise more than a hundred million Kenya shillings to help meet hospital bills for the injured. Bomb blasts are but some of the major tragedies that the society has had to deal with. In March 2001, a fire broke out at Changuli Boys Boarding School in Machakos, claiming the lives of 67 pupils and teachers. The prompt response of the Red Cross in offering relief and moral support to those affected proved to be a turning point in Kenyans' perception of the society's humanitarian capabilities. That perception would be strengthened later when the society handled other fire tragedies. When on January 28, 2009, a fire gutted the Nakumat supermarket in downtown Nairobi, killing 29 shoppers and staff and injuring many others, Kenya Red Cross Society volunteers and staff responded promptly. The Society's team from the Nairobi branch arrived at the scene soon after the fire started and was shortly joined by the Red Cross headquarters Karen Langata and Thika Branch's response teams. The first response included the movement of casualties from the scene to Kenyatta National Hospital. The society teams supplied first aid to the injured and counselling to shocked relatives and friends. They gave water donated by well-wishers to rescuers working in the smoke-filled supermarket building. For the next 24 hours, Kenya Red Cross Society maintained operations at the site, with a total of 220 volunteers and staff being involved in the initial stages. The number was gradually reduced to 43 volunteers who continued with recovery, tracing and counselling services until February 4, 2009. The Red Cross provided humanitarian services in Nairobi even as it responded to a fire tragedy that took place 230 kilometers away at Sachangwan in Molo district. This was only two days after the Nakumat fire when a long-haul petroleum truck with approximately 10,000 litres of inflammable petroleum products overturned, spilt its contents and caught fire. 
It is reported that between 6.30 p.m. and 7 p.m., an explosion occurred while people were scrambling for spilled fuel. The ensuing fire engulfed all the people who had gathered around the spilled fuel, killing 100 people, 95 on the spot, while five died later in Nakuru and Nairobi hospitals. More than 238 people escaped with burns that ranged from very severe to minor. Additional deaths continued to be reported in the days that followed the incident, the final figure reaching 140. During the entire operation, the Kenya Red Cross Society attended to more than 70 people with varying degrees of burns and recovered more than 100 charred remains of people who perished in the fire. Kenya Red Cross had come of age as the face of humanitarian response in Kenya. Fires are human-made tragedies, but they're usually accidents. Other human-made tragedies are not. Since independence, Kenya has had to give refuge to hundreds of thousands of people running away from some neighboring countries due to political instability. After General Idi Amin gained power in Uganda in 1971, many Ugandans fled to Kenya to escape Amin's regime of terror. By the end of 1976, official UN figures placed the number of refugees from Uganda in Kenya at 500. These numbers would soar to 4,000 by the end of 1977. The Kenya Red Cross, for the very first time since its inception, responded to a refugee crisis. In conjunction with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and the International Federation of the Red Cross, the Society provided shelter and sanitation material, food and water, as well as medicines. The Uganda refugee experience would go some way in preparing the Kenya Red Cross for its biggest refugee challenge following the fall in 1991 of the regime of military dictator Siad Barre in neighboring Somalia. Somali refugees fleeing the turmoil that followed Siad Barre's ousting began arriving by their thousands at the Kenya-Somalia border. They were in a pathetic situation, tortured and ravaged by war and violence, and weakened by days and nights of walking, often with little or nothing to eat. After obtaining entry into Kenya, the refugees were concentrated in different camps, with many being within what is now the county of Garissa. Siad Barre's ousting did not mean an end to political upheavals in Somalia. Matters did in fact get worse, as the government machinery in the country collapsed due to a generalized civil war that pitted different Somali groups against one another. The war and incessant droughts and famine have resulted in even more Somalis seeking refuge in Kenya. So serious has the situation been that Dadaab, the main camp holding Somali refugees in Kenya, is now the largest refugee camp in the whole world, holding well over half a million refugees. This was a situation that called for a major humanitarian emergency intervention to meet the refugees' food, water, sanitation and medical needs. And it was a challenge that the Kenya Red Cross Society met with great commitment. A commitment that it has maintained for more than two decades. Because of its sterling services, the society was, in 2011, assigned the task of overall camp management at the IFO camps in Dadaab, with the mandate to oversee all camp operations. It is the hope of the Kenya Red Cross Society, as well as most Kenyans, that recent political developments in Somalia will lead to a more stable country, resulting in a scaling down of Red Cross Somali refugee operations, as more Somalis are resettled in their country. In 2012, Somalia had a new elected parliament and a president who has the support of the African community of states. Peace has returned to many parts of the country, partly as a result of military intervention by a pan-African force in support of the new Somali government. Refugees from Somalia and neighboring countries have not been the only ones the Kenya Red Cross Society has been called upon to assist. 
Conflicts in Kenya have from time to time displaced many people from their homes and forced them to seek refuge elsewhere in the country. Many of these internally displaced persons, or IDPs, have depended on relief and humanitarian assistance from the society. In July 2005, there were inter-ethnic skirmishes in the Turbi area of northwest Turkana district, which left more than 80 people dead, nearly a third of them women and children. The massacre was the biggest response operation of the society as a result of inter-ethnic conflict. The deaths came after hundreds of armed raiders of the Borana tribe attacked the Gabra people living in the Turbi area, forcing more than 6,000 people to flee their homes and seek refuge in Marsabit town. The fighting was a result of ethnic competition over scarce water resources and pasture land in the arid and semi-arid areas of the country, especially along the Somali, Ethiopia and Sudan borders. A week after the Turbi massacre, the society reported that Marsabit had around 9,000 displaced persons, mainly Gabra. It appealed for 54 million Kenya shillings in aid, but even though it received much less, the Kenya Red Cross Society managed to provide humanitarian services to the victims of the massacre. Kenya has experienced other kinds of ethnic conflicts besides those caused by scarcity of water and grazing land. The Kenya Red Cross Society's humanitarian services have often been called upon to assist victims of such conflicts, especially those associated with national elections. Such was the case in 1992, when ethnic violence in some parts of Rift Valley province resulted in more than 2,000 people losing their lives and many more their homes. The society would be called upon again to respond to similar inter-ethnic conflicts during and after the 1997 and 2002 general elections. The internal human displacement in 1992, 1997 and 2002 was not massive, but it gave the Kenya Red Cross Society a foretaste of what was to come following the disputed presidential election of 2007 when post-election violence in many parts of the country cost more than 1,300 Kenyans their lives and half a million their homes. More than 350,000 internally displaced persons would end up in camps. Nearly six years later, and many of them are still in those camps. The humanitarian crisis caused by the 2007-2008 post-election violence was so serious that the government was forced to appoint the Kenya Red Cross Society as the lead coordinating agency for the response to the emergency. The good thing that we have in our interaction or intervention is that we are neutral. And that has assisted us much that when there's a problem between communities, at least when the Kenya Red Cross goes in, it is, they are seen as a honest broker in that particular area and uh, we are able to provide a service that is required at that particular time. But we don't end there. We also try to talk to the communities. We believe that it's also part of our mandate to talk to the leadership so that they can minimize, because if they talk to their people, they can minimize the amount of suffering that can be brought in because of conflicts. The society responded to the plight of post-election violence victims even as it continued with one of the biggest challenges in its humanitarian efforts. The challenge of dealing with the ravages of cyclical droughts that afflict many parts of the country. These include Baringo, Laikipia, Turkana, Samburu, Narok and Kajiado in Rift Valley, Marsabit and Isiolo in Eastern Province, Mandera, Garissa and Wajir in Northeastern, and Tana River, Kilifi, Kwale and Taitataveta in Coast Province. In 1971, a major drought would hit most of northern Kenya, leading to the loss of human lives and livelihoods among the majority pastoralists of the area. Sadly, the government denied the drought's existence. The Kenya Red Cross Society would end up being a lone ranger in responding to the needs of overwhelming numbers at risk of famine. 
On February 23rd that year, the society launched the first ever international appeal for food in Kenya after the government, under pressure, had finally declared the drought a national disaster. Drought and the accompanying famine would become the main preoccupations of the Kenya Red Cross Society for most of the first half of the 1980s. In partnership with other organizations, such as the World Food Organization, the society solicited support from within and outside Kenya to assist in feeding people ravaged by drought. The society led non-governmental organizations and other interested parties to join the government in 1985 in formulating a national disaster plan aimed at forestalling famine from droughts and dealing with other kinds of natural disasters. Unfortunately, the government never implemented the plan, leaving Kenyans exposed to disasters with piecemeal prevention and mitigation measures the only respite they could fall back on. Had the plan been in place, the country could have coped better with the drought of 2011, the worst drought in the whole of the Eastern Africa region in more than 60 years. Government estimates put the figure of those at risk of dying from starvation at more than 5 million, and more than 3.5 million were in need of urgent relief. For me, my major concern today, we don't have a national disaster policy even after 30 years of discussion on this issue. Well, unfortunately, because of the frequent change in the government, change in the civil service, a lot of interference by outsiders, I believe every country should domesticate its own policy. There has been a lot of work uh, being put by UN, uh, INGOs and others, but uh, I believe the ownership should be ours. Uh, I'm being very nationalistic here. Uh, we have uh, some of the best brands in the world that can develop these policies, but it's just uh, been not been properly handled, I would say, over the years. And we've seen uh, us running from one crisis to another and, and not very uh, well-coordinated, well-managed at times because of lack of this. We've been part of a team in the Ministry of Special Program that was working, but when you're not in the driving seat and someone else is and someone has other agendas, then it becomes very difficult. But uh, I think there is an urgent need to have a comprehensive uh, disaster policy. When it became clear that the government was not up to the task of dealing with the impending catastrophe, many leading Kenyan businesses and the Kenya Red Cross joined hands and set up what they called the Kenyans for Kenya or K4K campaign to feed the hungry and later support livelihoods among the most vulnerable. Corporate entities contributed heavily towards the success of the campaign. Spearheaded initially by the Kenya Commercial Bank, Safaricom, the Media Owners Association and administered by the Kenya Red Cross Society, the Kenyans for Kenya initiative ended up raising about 1 billion shillings in cash and kind to support efforts to end food insecurity in Kenya. If there is anything that I feel proud to have been associated with, one of them is the Kenya Red Cross Society. Okay. It's an example of what determination and goodwill can achieve. A place like Turkana Pokot uh, and the entire I mean, Northeastern, including part of the coast, and uh, Ukambani, where, you know, year in, year out, we are always appealing for food. We are moving away from that. Of course, we are doing it because if a drought ha happens, that is our goal. We have to go there and provide food. But we want to say no. We want to go a step further and see and put initiatives where people can now plant their own crops, where people can do what we call drip irrigation where even they can go into these um, uh, greenhouses and produce a uh, produce which they can use either eat or sell. And if they have enough to eat tomorrow, and I've been told that if you do irrigation in Turkana, forget about uh, Wasingishu, Pungoma, and uh, parts of Western Kenya and uh, Central Kenya, they'll be able to feed us. For me, uh, the biggest thing I want to 
celebrating 50 years of independence. While, yes, we've had the bad patch of uh, history in, in the society being mismanaged, but I think uh, overall I would say today the institution is much stronger uh, than any other in this continent. It is one of the highly respected uh, globally. But uh, what I want to really echo and, and celebrate here is the heroes and heroines who have tirelessly given their lives and time and money and resources and energy in volunteering for this organization. 